speaks at the outset on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists. Let me all who are present here in person, as well as as got connected online to welcome all of you for this academic activity, the monthly clinical meeting that's being organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists. I take this opportunity to thank the president, Dr. Damika Gunadhana, and the Council of the Sri Lanka College of Hematologists for the commitment and the interest taken to collaborate with the Sri Lanka Medical Association in organizing today's program. Today, there would be three cases to be presented by Dr. Vasanta Vikram, Vasanti Vikramasinghe, Senior Registrar of Clinical Hematology, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, Dr. Lalindra Gunaratna, Senior Lecturer and Honorary Consultant Hematologist, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, and that will be followed by the MCQs in the form of a quiz. So let me now invite Dr. Vasanti Vikramasinghe to present her cases, and that would be in a form of case-based discussion. I mean, she would present her case, will be followed by Dr. Lalindra Gunaratna discussing the case. Thank you. You know, and welcome to the first monthly clinical meeting for the year 2021, organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm Dr. Vasanti Vikramasinghe, Senior Registrar of Clinical Hematology from Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. And first of all, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting us to conduct this clinical forum. So I would be discussing three case scenarios, which would be follow each followed by a discussion by Dr. Lalitra Gunaratna. So the first case is a 51-year-old businessman from Kalania who's diagnosed patient with diabetes and dyslipidemia for three years, who presented to the hematologic clinic with an incidental finding of high hemoglobin. He didn't have any hyperviscosity features like headache, visual symptoms, or neurological symptoms. He didn't have any chronic lung diseases, heart diseases, or any history of liver renal diseases. And also he was not on any drugs causing polycythemia. Any symptoms suggestive of primary polycythemia, such as pruritus after bathing, abdominal distension, or early satiety, suggestive of splenomegaly or B symptoms were not there. He was taking an adequate fluid intake and had given up smoking 10 years back and was a social drinker. On further inquiry, his wife admitted that he had significant snoring at night and also he claimed that he was feeling sleepy most of the daytime. There was no family history of any hematological disorders or any history of liver renal cystic diseases and no history of arterial venous thrombosis or hemorrhages. For his diabetes, he was taking metformin with satisfactory glycemic control without any micro or macrovascular complications, and dyslipidemia was managed with statins. He was leading a stressful and sort of sedentary lifestyle. On examination, he was afebrile, plethoric, there was no cyanosis, and he was not dysmic. BMI was 29, and there was central obesity, and also there was evidence of acanthosis nigricans. Cardiovascular, respiratory, and CNS examination didn't reveal any positive findings, and abdominal examination didn't show any organomegaly. So in summary, this is a 51-year-old businessman with diabetes and dyslipidemia for three years without any macro or microvascular complications, presenting with an isolated increase of hemoglobin without any hyperviscosity symptoms. No clinical features of primary polycythemia and has features of obstructive sleep apnea is an ex-smoker and a social drink. On examination, he's plethoric, obese with features of metabolic syndrome and the systemic examination is normal. So what are the possible causes for his polycythemia? Is it secondary, is it apparent, or is it primary polycythemia? So when there is raised hemoglobin, the ideal way to diagnose polycythemia would be to estimate the red cell mass. However, this is not routinely done. If there is raised red cell mass, it is called true polycythemia, whereas if it's not raised, it's called apparent polycythemia. True polycythemia could be either primary, secondary, or idiopathic. Primary polycythemia, there is 
uh, intrinsically abnormal hemopoiesis, and in secondary erythropolycythemia, there is an increased erythropoietin drive. Idiopathic erythrocytosis is a diagnosis of exclusion where there are no identifiable causes. On the other hand, apparent polycythemia is raised hemoglobin secondary to a reduction in plasma volume. This is seen usually in dehydration where the plasma volume is low. The primary polycythemia could be either congenital or acquired. Congenital ones are usually due to mutations in the erythropoietin receptor. Primary acquired polycythemia is polycythemia vera. Secondary polycythemia can also be either congenital or acquired. Congenital secondary polycythemias are usually seen with defects in the oxygen sensing pathways, for an example, the von Hippel-Lindau mutations, and with high affinity oxygen and enzyme deficiencies causing a lift shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. Acquired poly secondary polycythemias could be hypoxia driven, which could be either central hypoxia, for an example, with chronic lung diseases, right to left cardiopulmonary shunts, smoking, sleep apnea, or could be due to local renal hypoxia, such as renal artery stenosis, renal cysts, and hydronephrosis. There could also be pathological erythropoietin production by tumors like hepatocellular renal cell and cerebellar hemangioblastomas, and also uterine myomas. There are certain drugs which also can give rise to secondary polycythemia, such as exogenous erythropoietin, androgens, anabolic steroids. Alcohol excess is another cause of secondary polycythemia, and also this is seen in the post-renal transplant setting. So how do we investigate a patient with erythrocytosis? According to the British Society of Hematology guidelines, a persistently raised hematocrit of in males more than 52% and in females more than 48% needs for the evaluation. However, there are some controversies regarding the cutoff points of diagnosing polycythemia. So for practical purposes, we'll be using the British Society of Hematology recommendations. And in such a patient, a thorough history and examination is mandatory. We should look for clear secondary causes. And if there are any clear secondary causes, we might be able to stop investigations and correct the course if possible. However, we should be careful because there could be rare cases of dual pathologies. If there are no clear secondary causes, then the next step would be to do a jak 2 v 617 f mutation analysis, which is seen in more than 95% of the polycythemia vera patients. If this is negative, again, we should look for secondary causes. And if there are no secondary causes from history examination and investigations, then further classification of polycythemia can be done depending on the serum erythropoietin level. This would be usually high in secondary erythrocytosis and usually low in primary polycythemia. So if it's low, a jak 2 exon 12 mutation analysis, which is a rare type of mutation seen in polycythemia vera, should be done. Serum erythropoietin could be either normal or low in idiopathic erythrocytosis. So the initial investigations would be full blood count, blood picture, liver renal functions, pulse oximetry, serum ferritin, erythropoietin, and JAK2V617F mutation. And the, first, the investigations would depend on the base initial investigation results. So we repeated the full blood count of our patient after hydration, which revealed a persistently high hematocrit with normal WBC counts and platelet counts. Blood picture revealed red cells impact arrangement, which were normochromic and normocytic, normal white cell counts and differential counts without any eosinophilia or basophilia. Platelets were normal. ESR was five. Liver functions and renal functions were normal. Ultrasound scan abdomen revealed a grade two fatty liver without any hepatosplenomegaly, evidence of renal parenchymal diseases or hepatic or renal cysts. Since he gave a history of snoring and daytime somnolence, we did the pulse oximetry both during awake times as well as in the sleep. The SpO2 was significantly lower during sleep with values less than 90%. Therefore, we did a respiratory referral and conducted sleep studies, which confirmed the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. So what is the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea causing erythrocytosis? So during sleep, the gravity and muscle relaxation allows the tongue and the surrounding soft tissue to fall back into the throat area, obstructing the airflow. 
So there would be snoring and also hypoxia and hypocarbia. This hypoxia will induce erythropoietin and there would be erythrocytosis. How do we manage uh, secondary erythrocytosis due to obstructive sleep apnea? The mainstay of management would be lifestyle modifications with weight reduction, exercise, reduction of alcohol consumption. Orthodontic devices can also be tried to keep the upper airway patent. And for severe cases, long-term non-invasive continuous positive airway pressure can be tried. Venous sections are considered only in symptomatic hyperviscosity or if the hematocrit is more than 56 to bring it down to around 50 to 52. So that is the end of the first case. So now Dr. Lalindra will discuss the important factors on the topic polycythemia. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, let me start off by saying that this patient that Vasanti uh, presented is not me, uh, although there are some similarities. Uh, so basically, when we look at polycythemia, we know it's a fairly common uh, condition. We get a lot of referrals with patients who have high hemoglo hemoglobins and PCVs. And I think the, the concern or the worry in most cases is whether this patient is having polycythemia vera because an increased risk of thrombosis, arterial more than venous, is associated with polycythemia vera. We must remember, however, that the other causes other than polycythemia vera is much far more common than polycythemia. If you can see uh, on the screen, I've put down the incidence in some parts of the world. You can see that the incidence is quite low. Uh, Europe and in US and some studies show that in the Asian region also, uh, there is uh, a degree of polycythemia, about 3.6 to 5 um, per 100,000 population. But the age of presentation in our part of the world seems to be a little less than in the uh, Western part of the world. Now, the features that will support polycythemia vera are pruritis, which is seen in a majority of patients, leukocytosis and thrombocytosis seen in about 40% of patients, thrombocytosis more than leukocytosis, Splenomegaly, usually it's mild in PV, uh, past history of thrombosis, and then uh, the two uh, laboratory tests of the JAK2 mutation and low serum erythropoietin levels. But remember, again, that not every patient with polycythemia vera will have a low serum erythropoietin level. So now uh, this is a patient, uh, the report of a patient whom I saw recently. You can see that the uh, hematocrit is Sorry, the hemoglobin is about 17.9. The hematocrit is 49.8. But do you think this patient has polycythemia, uh, polycythemia vera? Because remember, that is the main thing that we want to exclude. Now, you can see this hemoglobin is quite high. But if you look at the other features of the WBC and the platelets, the platelets actually are quite low. Uh, not, not that it's high, it's low. So when you see some, a report like this, I think we must be, uh, uh, you know, uh, conscious of the fact that even though the patient has a high hemoglobin, that this is probably not polycythemia vera, okay? Right, so if we look at the diagnostic criteria, in 2008, the WHO said that to diagnose a patient with polycythemia vera, you must have a hemoglobin of 18.5 grams per deciliter in a male and or 16.5 grams per deciliter in a female with a high hematocrit of 52 or a, uh, in men and 48 in females. However, the WHO in 2016 drastically dropped down these cutoffs and said that a man will be diagnosed with polycythemia vera if the hemoglobin is 16.5 and the drop for women from 16.5 to only just 16, which is, you know, seems quite unfair. Uh, the hematocrit that the WHO used for men was 49, which was brought down from 52. And in women, it remained the same. Again, showing that there was some injustice done to men. Uh, if uh, they also said that to diagnose polycythemia vera or to exclude it, you have to do a bone marrow biopsy and do a JAK2 mutation. So if you look at the 2016 WHO, uh, a man who has a hemoglobin of just 16.5 grams per deciliter would have to undergo the suffering of a bone marrow biopsy as well as spend money on JAK2 mutation, which is not available in the government sector. However, fortunately for us, 
the uh, British Society of Hematology uh, didn't agree with this, and they said that uh, to, uh, uh, to, to consider a patient as being polycythemia vera, the hem hematocrit of a 52 for men and 48 for women uh, must be achieved. Uh, and they were not as uh, uh, unkind as the WHO and did not force everyone to have a bone marrow biopsy. Uh, but the JAK2 mutation was uh, made mandatory. Now, why did the WHO bring down this, uh, especially for men, the cutoffs quite significantly? Well, they found that quite a number of men who were having polycythemia vera were missed if the cutoff of the hemoglobin and the PCV was high. So they wanted to make sure that by bringing down these cutoffs, almost all the patients with polycythemia vera could be captured. However, there was a lot of dissent with this decision by other people. And uh, because, you know, people said that there was unnecessary cost and unnecessary uh, investigations done. And you can see that in males, about six and a half percent of males were, who did not have polycythemia had to undergo all these stringent investigations. The women, on the other hand, was only a fraction. So uh, if we take away the red cell mass, which we know none of us can really do, uh, I think we could sort of look at this afresh and say that the WHO criteria, which is applicable to us in Sri Lanka today, would be if men had a hemoglobin of more than 16.5 or a hematocrit of more than 49, and women who had a hemoglobin of more than 16 and a hematocrit of 48 would be considered to, uh, uh, or should be investigated to see whether the patient has polycythemia vera. However, uh, my take on this is this. Uh, I mean, when I see, or if a patient with polycythemia is referred to me, the first thing I would do is, to, as Vasanti said, to look for clinical features of polycythemia uh, and also the full blood count changes where the white cells and the platelets being high would be supportive. And then look for obvious secondary causes of polycythemia at the first encounter itself. So for example, if the patient had a BMI of you know whom, uh, you would suspect that this could be sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea. If the patient had uh, was a smoker, you would think that this probably was a contributory cause. Uh, and only if the patient or man would have a persistently high hematocrit of more than 52 or a woman a hematocrit of more than uh, 48, that I would venture out to do a JAK2 mutation early on in the disease. What about those... Uh, the, the patients who fell in the category between the WHO and the uh, BCSH category. That is, if a, if a man had a hematocrit of between 49 and 52, or if a woman had a hematocrit of less than 48, but a hemoglobin of more than 16. Again, in my mind, I would, I would sort of think that these patients are more likely not to have polycythemia vera and uh, look very closely at the clinical features for supportive diagnosis of polycythemia vera and exclude all the apparent and secondary causes of polycythemia vera before venturing uh, to ask the patient to, have to spend money on a JAK2 mutation. If the JAK2 mutation is positive, then I would request that they have a bone marrow biopsy just to support the diagnostic criteria of the WHO. And if it is negative, then to do a bone marrow biopsy together with serum erythropoietin levels. The second case is a 27-year-old primary who presented to her antenatal clinic booking visit at POA of 10 weeks. There was an incidental finding of thrombocytopenia in the routine full blood count done. There was no fever or history of recent viral infections, and also she didn't have any significant past medical history, any features of autoimmune diseases, and there was no bleeding or thrombosis history. She was not on any long-term medication, and her parents were non-consanguineous and there was no family history of any hematological disorders. On examination, she was a febrile, not pale, and there were no bleeding manifestations. The blood pressure was normal and the systemic examination didn't reveal any significant positive findings. So in summary, this is a 27-year-old primary, previously healthy, presenting with an incidental finding of isolated thrombocytopenia at the first trimester of pregnancy without any associated bleeding manifestations, no history of fever, viral infections, and no medical, significant medical history.
and no positive findings on examination. So what are the possible causes for her isolated thrombocytopenia? First of all, we'll have to diagnose whether this is true thrombocytopenia or whether this is a spurious thrombocytopenia. For that, we will repeat a full blood count and a blood picture. And in her case, it revealed true thrombocytopenia with platelet count of 73 and a mean platelet volume of 11.9 and normal WBC and hemoglobin levels. That picture showed non-chromic normocity cells with normal leukocyte count and differential counts and thrombocytopenia with some large platelets. So what is this mean platelet volume? It's the average size of the platelets, which is very important in finding causes of thrombocytopenia. The normal range is around 7.2 to 11.8 femtoliters. Low MPV indicating small platelets are seen in conditions affecting production of platelets by the bone marrow, for an example, seen in aplastic anemia. High MPV indicates a functioning bone marrow and release of immature platelets rapidly into the circulation. So what are the possible causes of thrombocytopenia in the first trimester of pregnancy? Here we have to consider all causes of thrombocytopenia in a non-pregnancy state since this is just the first, first trimester. So the causes could differ with, depending on whether there is isolated thrombocytopenia or whether there are any associated systemic disorders. And also the causes could be pregnancy specific or non-pregnancy specific. Depending on the trimester of pregnancy, the causes could differ. For an example, in the first trimester, if there is thrombocytopenia, the most common cause could be, would be ITP. Whereas in the second and third trimesters, the most common cause would be gestational thrombocytopenia. So how do we evaluate a patient with thrombocytopenia in pregnancy? The recommended initial tests would be a complete blood count, retic count, blood picture, liver functions, and virology. Further testing should be considered if clinically indicated, including the autoimmune profile, thyroid functions, the antiphospholipid antibodies, etc. So once the patient has a thrombocytopenia, we will look at a blood picture and confirm that it is true thrombocytopenia. And sometimes the blood picture itself might give diagnostic clues. For an example, if there are giant platelets and WBC inclusions that may indicate hereditary thrombocytopenias like may higgling anomaly. And there could be features like frag red cell fragments, which could favor a diagnosis of TTP HUS. Since gestational thrombocytopenia and ITP are the commonest cause, co common causes of thrombocytopenia in pregnancy, it's important to differentiate between these two. In gestational thrombocytopenia, the, usually the platelet count is more than 50 to 70,000, and it usually occurs in mid late second trimester and third trimesters and there is postpartum resolution, and there is no associated neonatal thrombocytopenia with gestational thrombocytopenia. So in our patient, there was no evidence of any congenital thrombocytopenias and no secondary causes were found. So clinically, it was diagnosed as ITP. So how do we manage ITP during pregnancy? The decision regarding therapy is individualized and it depends on the urgency of platelet increment, the duration the increment is required and the potential side effects of the treatment. So in a pregnant lady in the first and second trimesters, if the platelet count is more than 30,000 and if there is no bleeding, we don't have to initiate treatment. And if the platelet count is less than 30 or there is clinically relevant bleeding, we might have to start treatment and the initial First line treatment options would be oral corticosteroids or IVIG. The dose of oral corticosteroids is also lower than in a normal ITP patient, given the risk of risk to both mother and the fetus. At the time of the delivery, a platelet count of more than 50,000 is aimed. And for regional anesthesia also, a minimum platelet count of more than 50 is indicated and preferably a count more than 70 to 80,000. Platelet transfusions in ITP is generally not effective. However, we can consider platelet transfusions in conjunction with IVIG at emergency settings. About 10% of the newborns of ITP mothers can have a platelet count of less than 50,000 at birth. Therefore, a platelet count should be performed on cord blood samples. If the platelet count is normal on the cord blood sample, there's no need to repeat the counts, however, 
observation should be done to look for bleeding. If there is thrombocytopenia on the cord blood sample, daily platelet counts should be continued until five to seven days because the nadir platelet count occur occurs by day two to day five. And also a cranial ultrasound scan is indicated when the platelet count is less than 50 to exclude intracranial hemorrhage. Bleeding can be managed with IVIG and platelet transfusions. Usually a spontaneous rise of the platelets occur by day seven. So in our patient, the platelet count remained more than 30,000 during the first and second trimesters. Therefore, no treatment was initiated. However, by 35 weeks of gestation, there was a drop of platelets to 25,000. Therefore, she was started on oral prednisolone, 0.5 milligrams per kg per day, for which she showed a good response. And this was continued until delivery at 39 weeks and was then tapered off. Neonatal platelet count, was normal. So Dr. Lalindra will now discuss the various therapeutic options available for ITP in pregnancy. Okay, so in most patients with uh, ITP in pregnancy, uh, steroids would do the trick. Uh, and if that's not possible, IVIG in most instances would uh, be sufficient to carry the patient towards or throughout the pregnancy and thereafter. Uh, however, there are a few patients who are refractory to both steroids and uh, IVIG also does not uh, maintain the platelet count at a re for a reasonable amount of time. And then we would have to maybe repeat the IVIG, especially close to the time of delivery. Now, what are the other agents that are available or can be given in pregnancy? Uh, you know that more, uh, a lot of our patients who are steroid refractory or uh, actually who don't, uh, who need a large dose of steroids are started on azathioprine in Sri Lanka. Now, azathioprine, uh, if you look at the literature, is sort of a relative, con there's a relative contraindication with the use of azathioprine. However, uh, if you have started azathioprine in the pre-pregnancy state, then it is okay, it's safe to continue the azathioprine throughout pregnancy. And I think it's better to continue with something like that than to get into trouble once you, uh, you know, once you uh, really have a, re a refractory type of ITP. A lot of the other immunosuppressives that uh, we use in the non-pregnant state are not uh, indicated on, or should not be used in pregnancy. Uh, uh, but fortunately, there are two newer therapies, both of which are available in Sri Lanka which have been uh, readily used in the non-pregnant patient. The first is the recombinant uh, thrombopoietin, uh, recombinant thrombopoietin, uh, the, and uh, it is registered in Sri Lanka and it can be used. And there was this study done by the Chinese a few years ago and reported in blood where they uh, gave uh, uh, recombinant thrombopoietin just like, you know, like, just like erythropoietin uh, to 31 patients uh, at a dose of 300 units per kg once daily for 14 days. And out of these 31, 23 patients had a good response, including 10 complete responders. And uh, there were 13 who responded with platelet counts of between 30 and 100. And uh, it is said that it appears that uh, recombinant thrombopoietin ameliorates the bleeding symptoms remarkably, even in those who did not respond. So it's see, and it and it's basically well tolerated as well. So there is a suggestion that uh, this is potentially safe and an effective treatment choice for patients with ITP during pregnancy. There is some sort of a concern by some uh, people that there could be the development of antibodies uh, to uh, or against thrombopoietin, but that has not been substantiated. The other agent that's available are the thrombopoietin uh, 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 RAs, which are like the uh, L-thrombopag and romiplostin. Uh, and these also have, there are many case reports and case series of this being used in uh, pregnancy. Uh, and uh, there was this multicenter preliminary observational study, again, which was published in blood, uh, which gave this to 15 pregnancies uh, sorry, 15 uh, uh, mothers who underwent 17 pregnancies. Uh, eight of them got L-thrombopag. And as you know, L-thrombopag is available in Sri Lanka. It's an oral drug uh, given at about 25 to 50 milligrams uh, daily. 
And this lot of mothers also were given somewhere between 25 to 100 milligrams daily uh, with, the media, with the mean dose of 50 milligrams daily. And this, this, they found that about 10 of the 15 pregnancies uh, of 15 mothers responded to them. And it was safe for both mother and the neonate. And this may be effective when administered before delivery. So two new agents available in Sri Lanka, which can be considered in dark, uh, in, in dark conditions. Thank you. The next patient is a 61-year-old, previously healthy man who presented to the hospital with fever of a respiratory tract symptoms for three days duration. Fever was high grade and intermittent associated with some sore throat and non-productive cough. There was no shortness of breath. He didn't have any significant past medical history and was a non-smoker. Prior to admission, a COVID-19 rapid antigen test was done, which was negative. On, and on examination, he was febrile, but clinically well and hemodynamically stable, not pale, and there was no shortness of breath. The duration on air was 98%, and the cardiovascular and respiratory systems were normal. The initial investigations revealed a relatively marginally low WBC count with normal hemoglobin and platelets, and the blood picture was in favor of a possible viral infection. Inflammatory markers were marginally elevated, liver renal functions were normal. So initially he was managed as a probable viral upper respiratory tract infection. On day two after admission, he developed right calf pain and swelling, and calf was red, swollen, tender, and warm. The peripheral pulses were there. A Doppler scan of the lower limb was done, which confirmed a diagnosis of DVT of right popliteal vein extending to femoral and external iliac veins. On the same day, a few hours later, he developed sudden onset respiratory distress. He was tachypneic and tachycardic, but the blood pressure remained stable. Saturation on air dropped to 92%. Lungs were clear without any added sounds. ECG showed sinus tachycardia and the chest X-ray didn't show significant positive findings like consolidation or an emothorax. With the clinical diagnosed possibility of pulmonary embolism, with the given history of DVT in the lower limb, CT pulmonary angiogram was done, which revealed a saddle embolus with extension of embolus into right and left pulmonary arteries. There was a neutrophil, mild neutrophil leukocytosis by this time with elevated inflammatory markers and deranged coagulation profile with elevated PT, APGT, and D-dimer levels. Because of the clinical suspicion, a COVID PCR test was carried out, which later became positive. So he was managed in the HDU with oxygen and therapeutic anticoagulation, and he remained hemodynamically stable. So a few words about this COVID-19. It's the seventh member of coronavirus identified, which is a single-stranded RNA virus. And most patients who are infected with COVID-19 show only mild symptoms, whereas some develop severe complications like acute respiratory distress syndrome, coagulopathy and thrombosis, sepsis, and multi-organ failure and death. So this virus binds to the host cells via the receptor angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is expressed in a wide range of human cells, including the endothelial cells, lung pneumocytes, and lymphocytes. So what are the hematological manifestations of COVID-19? There could be blood count abnormalities. Anemia is usually not very prominent. The most common leukocyte change is lymphopenia, which is seen in up to 83% of the patients, there would be reduction in both CD4 and CD8 positive lymphocytes. There would be neutrophilia and neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio will be increased. And also there can be drop in eosinophils, monocytes and basophils. Mild thrombocytopenia is seen in about one third of patients. However, severe thrombocytopenia is unusual. Lymphopenia, neutrophilia, and severe thrombocytopenia are features of prognostic significance. The blood picture features could be a left shift of granulopoiesis with hypergranulation and vacuolation, leukoerythroblastic features, and reactive and plasmacytoid lymphocytes. Inflammatory markers would be high, and including ferritin. And in this special condition called COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, there would be elevated D-dimers, prolonged PT, APTT, and fibrinogen. 
So ferritin, D-dimers, and PT are also features of prognostic significance. So the topic uh, COVID-19 associated coagulopathy has gained a lot of interest and there's rapidly growing evidence explaining the pathogenesis of it. And it's uh, known to be due to multiple factors. There is direct endothelial damage by virus as well as the immune cells causing endothelial activation, activation of platelets and disruption of natural anticoagulants. And there would be an inflammatory response causing a cytokine storm-like situation, again, activating the coagulation cascade. In up to 50% of the patients, there could be development of antiphospholipid antibodies, which is again, a procoagulant status. And the acute phase procoagulant factors like factor eight, one milligram factor and fibrinogen will also be elevated. And on the other hand, the fibrinolytic system can be shut down with increased plasminogen activator inhibitor. So once that virus enters the body, it enters the cells via the angiotensin converting enzyme and it destroys the endothelium, exposing the glycoprotein calyx and there would be activation of the endothelium as well as the platelets. Also the inflammatory cells will express tissue factor, activating the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Because of the chemokines and the cytokines released by these cells, there would be recruitment of neutrophils and further propagation of the inflammatory response, causing further activation of the coagulation cascade, complementing the, by the complement cascade as well. So this also shows the same thing. There would be a storm of cytokines, ultimately giving rise to fibrin clots, impairment of natural anticoagulant pathways, and shutdown of fibrinolysis. So there is overwhelming evidence that COVID-associated coagulopathy is associated with higher morbidity and mortality. Therefore, several guidelines have been established by various organizations, including the British Society of Hematology, American Society of Hematology, and International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis. There are some certain differences between their opinions. However, the consensus recommendation is that all hospitalized patients should be started on thromboprophylaxis. So for the prevention of thrombosis, all hospitalized patients should have coagulation tests on admission, including PT, APTT, fibrinogen, platelet count, and D-dimer, and they should be monitored. Pharmacological thromboprophylaxis should be given to all patients unless contraindicated. Contraindications could be active bleeding and a platelet count of less than 25. Standard dose of thromboprophylaxis of low molecular weight heparin is preferred by most of these recommendations. However, some consider intermediate to high prophylactic doses in high risk patients, such as ICU patients and patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And monitoring of low molecular weight heparin is advised in severe renal impairment and abnormal PT-ABGT is not a contraindication for anticoagulation. Since low molecular weight heparin has also some anti-inflammatory properties, it may have an added benefit in COVID infection. Mechanical thromboprophylaxis should be given if pharmacological management is contraindicated. So how do we treat venous thrombosis? Confirmed venous thrombosis has to be treated with therapeutic dose anticoagulation, and if Diagnostic tests are not possible. However, there is clinical suspicion of venous thrombosis. Again, therapeutic anticoagulation should be considered. For arterial thrombosis, especially acute coronary syndrome, dual antiplatelets and full dose anticoagulation, unless contraindicated, should be given. However, non-urgent invasive cardiac procedures can be deferred. Bleeding with COVID-19 is rare. The management of bleeding in COVID-19 would be similar to bleeding in DIC patients, where the platelet count has to be maintained more than 50 with platelet transfusions. And for deranged coagulation, with bleeding can be managed with FFP. And for a hyperfibrinogenemia, cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrates can be given. So this brings to the end of the final case presentation. And Dr. Lalindra will now brief you on some important aspects of COVID-associated coagulopathy. Okay, so uh, if you look at uh, CAC, the accurate incidence is not known, but results from several studies suggest that there's an increased incidence of venous and arterial thrombosis, 
and several risk factors have been identified. If you look at this uh, paper in general thrombosis uh, hemostasis by Saskia Middletop and uh, her, her investigator, co investigators, you can see that uh, uh, patients, all patients, the ICU patients and the patients in wards, all of them have a significant uh, risk of developing segmental pulmonary embolism, proximal leg DVT, and the last column would show symptomatic VTE. So these are all clinically significant. And this uh, meta, uh, review and meta-analysis uh, of 36 studies, uh, both in the ICU setting and the non-ICU setting, show that the pool incidence of VTE is about, was about 28% in the ICU setting. You can see that uh, PE was obviously less than the DVTs and arterial thrombosis is significantly less than venous thrombosis. In the non-ICU setting also, the incidence of VT was about 10% with uh, no PEs and about 1% of patients having DVT. What are the risk factors for increased risk of thrombosis? There are patient-related factors like the age, male sex, hypertension, cardiovascular morbidity and immobilization, then pneumonia-related factors like if the patient is in the ICU, uh, having uh, indwelling central venous catheters, endothelial damage, an increase in factor eight von Willebrand factor complexes, and an increase in uh, hypoxia inducible factor one. The SARS related uh, factors are the increase in the angiotensin, increase in cytokines, increase in tissue factor, and the plasminogen activator inhibitor being increased. A lot of these, which we cannot do, uh, you know, on, on, as, as part of our routine testing. Now, what is the difference between uh, kick and sick? That is COVID-induced coagulopathy and sepsis-induced coagulopathy. Both of them uh, can result in sort of a DIC-like picture. But if you compare the two, you can see that it, with the conventional sepsis and there's DIC, there's increase in the APTT or prolongation of the APTT, PT. Uh, initially, the fibrinogen will be high as an acute inflammatory marker and then when there's consumption, the fibrinogen will come down. There's a significant thrombocytopenia. Fibrinogen uh, degradation products will be high, and the D-dimers also will be high. And the blood picture will show red cell fragmentation and schistocytes. However, in the COVID sepsis or the DIC in COVID, uh, one of the key features is that the coagulopathy is not as marked as that with sepsis. And uh, the thrombocytopenia is not as marked as with sepsis. However, the D-dimers are markedly increased and there are no schistocytes in the blood picture. <clears throat> and this goes to show that there is a, probably a restricted microvascular thrombosis of the pulmonary vessels and certain other organs uh, where there is, you get a restricted thrombotic microangiopathy and not a widespread thrombotic angio microangiopathy. Uh, and that's why you don't see schistocytes. And the platelet count is also not as low as in sepsis. So uh, this is a, a kick scoring system, which I'm not going to dwell into, and also uh, an algorithm based on that, uh, which you know uh, you can refer blood reviews from October last year uh, if you want more details on that. But what I will uh, finish off is with the most simple algorithm, uh, which is published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. So as Vasanti mentioned, the four main uh, parameters or the laboratory parameters would be the D-dimer, prothrombin time, the platelet count, and the fibrinogen. Now, if the D-dimer is markedly raised and there is no real uh, uh, definition of saying markedly raised, but we know that if it's three to four fold, if there's a three to four fold rise from the baseline of D-dimer, that is pretty significant. If the prothrombin time is prolonged, the platelet count less than 100 and the fibrinogen less than two, then this patient uh, should be considered, uh, you know, should consider admitting this patient, even if there is no other uh, concern clinically. And then once admitted, the patient should be monitored at least twice daily with these same parameters. Uh, the patient should be started on prophylactic dose, low molecular weight heparin uh, in all patients with, uh, uh, even, as, even if they're not in the ICUs, and then if there is worsening of the condition, then they should be uh, uh, treated as 
like for a DIC, uh, where the, there's a red box there on the side and Vasanti has detailed them as well. So this is something, uh, an algorithm which can be used uh, by us, except for the fibrinogen maybe, which we can't do readily and regularly. Uh, this is something. And then just a, an, another uh, uh, small uh, presentation on the therapeutic and the prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. Again, published in blood reviews, uh, because there could be some confusion as to how much is therapeutic and how much is prophylactic. And you can see that the recommendation is that a therapeutic dose of enoxaparin would be one milligram per kg subcar every 12 hours. We all know that. Uh, and the prophylactic dose of enoxaparin would be 40 milligram subcut every 12 hourly. However, the adjustment should be done as we do usually uh, when there's renal impairment and the two extremes of weight. Uh, it is also recommended that anti TNA levels uh, are done uh, for those with renal impairment and the two extremes of weight, but which for us is not widely available. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lalindra, uh, and also thank you very much, uh, Vasanti, uh, Dr. Vasanti uh, Vikramasinghe, uh, for those three most interesting uh, cases, one on polycythemia, and then the other was on thrombocytopenia, and they're now on COVID-related uh, venous thrombosis. Um, I think that we are now ready for the uh, MCQ quiz, but before that, if there are any questions that uh, we would, I mean, I'm sure that the speakers would be uh, ready to answer. The, uh, the one question is that, can POEM syndrome cause PRV? Is there anything? Right. Uh, I think the short answer would be no. But uh, it's important to remember that uh, polycythemia is or can be associated with POEM syndrome. So uh, it's not that uh, POEM syndrome would cause uh, polycythemia vera, but definitely one of the criteria that we use to diagnose or we support the diagnosis of OM syndrome is polycythemia. Uh, and also I think thrombocytosis as well. So I don't think there is, you can say that OM syndrome will call polycythemia vera, but it does cause polycythemia. Uh, just for my interest, Lalinda, now during this time where this COVID was so prevalent, uh, how, uh, how, uh, often did they make use of so your services for these patients? I mean, was it so, I mean, did that make you all busy so much? Or, I mean, was it uh, uh, sort of a rare incident that you all were calling? Um, uh, you mean for the coagulopathy, madam? Yes. I mean, I think personally, of course, I've had no involvement in managing patients with COVID coagulopathy. But I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm actually can't answer the question, I'm not sure. But I, I think the hematologists at... Uh, uh, places like IDH, IDH must have been involved, but I couldn't uh, answer that question. But uh, certainly, is it, I mean. a, is, yes, is it is it a common occurrence among our these patients that uh, that we had? I mean, we had now about past fifty thousand patients. So was it common for them to get venous thrombosis? Right. So prophylactic before we right. And was it related to age of, and the other comorbidities of the patients? But there is a relationship. Yeah, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, madam, uh, if you take venous thrombosis, age has a correlation with that. And uh, arterial thrombosis, I think, was much rare, rare and then things like hypertension, and I think probably had an association with that. But I think age and uh, immobility, high BMI, those things, there was it was associated with uh, right. uh, the venous yeah. thrombosis. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's the time for us to move on to our next part of the uh, presentation. That would be MCQ quiz by Dr. Indika Somaratne. Uh, she's the consultant clinical hematologist, District General Hospital, Hambantara. Over to you, Dr. Somaratne. Thank you, madam. Good afternoon. So we have... Uh... Now moving to the final component of today's session, which is the hematology quiz. And it will consist uh, uh, of few MCQs based on clinical scenarios. And I will be discussing the answers at the end of each question. Okay, uh, the first question is, um, a 35 year old previously healthy man presented with a history of fever for two weeks, 
On examination, he had right-sided upper and lower limb weakness with power four out of five. Additionally, he was not oriented in time and place. He was noted to have mild stirring of speech as well. Therefore, he had an urgent NCCT brain followed by an MRI brain. So these are the images of the non-contrast CT as well as the MRI. I will give some time for you all to observe if there is any abnormalities. Okay, moving on to the other investigations, he had the full blood count, which showed a hemoglobin of eight grams per deciliter, uh, MCV 96, MCH 32. The white cell count uh, was 10,200 per microliters and the platelet count 38,000 with a retic count of 8%. Serum creatinine 1.5 milligrams per deciliter, serum bilirubin 3.6 milligrams per deciliter, LDH 966 units per liter, the PTAPTT was normal. And this is the image of the blood picture of this patient. So moving on to the question. The question is, what is the most appropriate initial management for this patient? A, platelet transfusion. B, rituximab. C, plasma exchange with steroids. D, IV immunoglobulin with steroids. E, caplacizumab. So we'll move on to the answer. So the answer is C, plasma exchange with steroids. So coming on to the discussion of this question. So this patient is a young patient, previously healthy. He presents with fever and neurological symptoms and signs. So if you look at the uh, images, uh, the non-contrast CT brain and MRI, the CT shows there are multiple bilateral hypodense lesions involving the white matter of the brain. And looking at the MRI, again, it shows bilateral multiple lesions, which are hyper intense and involve uh, the multiple. So these are suggestive of ischemic lesions, which are lacuna infarcts. So looking at the other investigations, he has anemia, severe thrombocytopenia, and the blood picture shows there are uh, multiple fragments um, suggesting that there's ongoing microangiopathic hemolysis. And the hemolytic markers are elevated with high LDH level indicating hemolysis as well as tissue hypoxia. Uh, the normal PTA PTT excludes possibility of a coagulopathy. Therefore, the diagnosis is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura with neurological involvement. So thrombocytopenia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and varied degree of organ damage uh, are characteristic in 3TP, and there's relative preservation of renal function tests. 95% of the time, it is acquired, and 5% congenital. So the diagnostic hallmark is reduced ADAMTS-13 enzyme activity, and if the level is less than 10 units, international units per deciliter, it's diagnostic. And uh, the presence of anti-ADMTS-13 antibodies um, uh, raises the possibility of immune-mediated pathogenesis. So the standard of care is plasma exchange and corticosteroids. The place for immunoglobulin? Immunoglobulins are not effective in uh, uh, TTP. It has not shown a significant uh, benefit in using IVIG in TTP. Right. I will uh, discuss the, uh, its options one by one. Yes. Uh, so platelet transfusion uh, is the, was the first option in the MCQ. And um, platelet transfusions, as you all know, contraindicated in TTP mm -hmm. unless there is life-threatening bleeding. And rituximab, we use rituximab in TTP, but mainly for prevention of relapses, and especially in patients with high risk disease with cardiac and neurological involvement, but not as a single agent, but with plasma exchange and steroids. So the answer is plasma exchange and steroids. And um, IV immunoglobulin, again, has not shown a significant benefit in TTP. And caplacizumab is a, a humanized monoclonal antibody, which would inhibit the interaction between the 
one will brand factor and platelets. And this has got the nice approval, but not again, not as a single agent, but with plasma exchange and steroids, because it has shown it re to reduce the time taken to improve the platelet count. But if you don't have facilities to do the MTS 13 activity levels, the ISTH guidelines says not to start this agent. Okay, so we'll move on to the question number two. This is a 44 year old woman presented with abdominal discomfort and early satiety for three months duration. There was no change in bowel habits. She did not complain of fever, loss of appetite or loss of weight. She has hypertension, which is under control with AC inhibitors. And on examination, she has a splenomegaly of six centimeters from the costal margin. So uh, I've given the full blood count and the blood picture. The full blood count shows that the white cell count is 68,000 per microliter with a hemoglobin of uh, 9.8 grams per deciliter, platelets 998,000 per microliter and the blood picture is given. And I have given the description of the blood picture as well to make it more easier. So the blood picture showed normal chromic normocytic red cells and there's marked leukocytosis with all stages of granulocytic maturation with predominance of neutrophils and myelocytes. There is eosinophilia and basophilia. The blast percentage was 1%. The question is, what is the most likely genetic abnormality this patient is likely to have A, JAK2V617F mutation, B, MPL mutation, C, CALAR mutation, D, BCRABL1 mutation, E, exon 12 mutation. Okay, moving on to the answer. The answer is D, BCRABL1 mutation. So this is a uh, typical uh, characteristic uh, a blood picture of a chronic patient with chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, diagnosis can be made with a typical peripheral blood picture in conjunction with uh, molecular or cytogenetic uh, uh, studies, presence of BCRABL1 mutation analysis or Philadelphia chromosome will confirm the diagnosis. Um, see all the other uh, mutations I have given the MPL, CALAR, JAK2 mutations, which include JAK, JAK2, V617F, and exon 12 mutations are seen in BCR, ABL, negative MPNs, which are the polycyte, uh, which are uh, polycythemia rubra vera, essential thrombosthenia, and myelofibrosis. So the correct answer is BCR, ABL1 mutation. Uh, question, uh, the third question is about a 22-year-old man uh, who presented to the emergency treatment unit with abdominal pain, chest pain, and shortness of breath. He's a diagnosed patient with sickle cell anemia. He's homozygous for HVS, was on hydroxuria, but defaulted treatment seven months ago. On examination, his heart rate was 112 beats per minute regular, blood pressure 130 by 70, respiratory rate 20, temperature 38.7 degrees centigrade and saturation was 91% on air. There were Krebs in the right lower lung field and apart from that, no other abnormality found. This is a chest X-ray and the full blood count revealed hemoglobin 9.5, HCT 28%, white blood cell count 16,000, platelets 188,000 with a retic count of 10% and the blood picture is also given. The patient was started on supplemental oxygen, adequate pain control, intravenous antibiotics and incentives phytometry, but he remained uh, hypoxic. The question is, the next step in your management would be A, hydroxuria, B, aggressive intravenous fluid resuscitation, C, red cell exchange, D, plasma exchange, E, therapeutic anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin. So moving on to the answer. The answer is red cell exchange. So this is a patient with sickle cell anemia. 
presenting with fever and uh, respiratory symptoms and signs. And the chest X-ray shows that there's consolidation in the right uh, lung field in the lower zone. And his HP is 9.5 and the blood picture shows characteristic sickle cells. So this is a patient who's having acute chest syndrome, which is defined as an acute illness characterized by fever and or respiratory symptoms accompanied by new pulmonary infiltrate on chest X-ray. The presence of hypoxia is not included in the definition, but in clinical practice, it predicts the severity of the disease as well as poor outcome. So the specific treatment for acute chest syndrome in uh, sickle cell patients is to provide oxygen, fluid resuscitation, analgesia, antimicrobials, incentive spirometry and chest physiotherapy and blood transfusion. Blood transfusion could be either top up or exchange transfusion, but exchange transfusion is indicated for patients with severe disease and who uh, and the patients who have higher HP levels more than nine grams per deciliter, uh, the aim is to reduce the HPS level and to improve the oxygenation. So hydroxyurea, uh, of course, is indicated in this patient, but not in the acute, because it will not um, change the acute uh, outcome. So it will, uh, we will have to uh, give hydroxyurea in order to prevent recurrences. And aggressive fluid resuscitation is not correct because uh, fluid resuscitation should be individualized and guided by fluid balance and cardiovascular state because if the patient develops pulmonary edema, that would worsen the outcome. So the red cell exchange is the right answer. Plasma exchange uh, is, not, is wrong. And therapeutic anticoagulation with low molecular heparin should be uh, given only when there's high suspicion of a pulmonary embolism, but if not, prophylactic dose is appropriate. So the fourth question, uh, 57 year old woman who is a diagnosed patient with hypothyroidism presents with fatigue. The full blood count shows a white cell count of 4,800 per microliter, hemoglobin 9.3 grams per deciliter, MCV 115 femtoliters, and the platelet count is 120,000 per microliter. The blood picture is given. The question is, the most specific test to confirm the diagnosis you suspect is A, a bone marrow biopsy, B, anti-intrinsic factor antibodies, C, gastric antiparietal cell antibodies, plasma homocysteine, E, serum vitamin B12. The answer to this question is B, anti-intrinsic factor antibodies. So this patient has macrocytic anemia with mild thrombocytopenia, and the blood picture shows there's hypersegmented neutrophils and macrocytes. So it's in suggestive of a B12 or folate deficiency. And the presence of hypothyroidism indicates that there, uh, suggests that there could be an autoimmune pathology, making the most likely diagnosis, uh, making a pernicious anemia the most likely diagnosis. And it is diagnosed by detecting anti-intrinsic factor antibodies. So anti-intrinsic factor antibodies um, have a very high positive predictive value. Uh, but it has low sensitivity where if you uh, of uh, 40 to 60 percent um, and uh, anti-gastric parietal cell antibodies can be positive in 10 percent of normal individuals. Therefore, we can't confirm the diagnosis by detecting anti-gastric parietal cell antibodies. So it is not a definitive test. So other tests, uh, other options in the question are test to confirm B12 deficiency. Again, for B12 deficiency also, there's no gold standard test, but the first line test is to do a vitamin B12 level. But in patients with pernicious anemia, when they have high T-intrinsic factor antibodies, 
we can have falsely normal levels. And plasma uh, total homocysteine level is a supplementary second line test, and it is not specific for the diagnosis. And bone marrow biopsy is rarely done uh, in B12 deficiency as well as in pernicious anemia, only for patients with unclear clinical picture. Okay, so the last question uh, is about a 46 year old man presented with uh, worsening of chronic left knee pain and swelling. And 12 years ago, he had a gunshot injury to the left knee. He also complained of feeling tired. Examination showed a large effusion in the left knee joint and mild pallor. His mini mental score was 22. X-rays of the left knee joint, full blood count and blood picture are given. So the first uh, X-ray or X-ray named A is the X-ray taken at the time of the gunshot injury and B is at this presentation. And the full blood count revealed HP 9.1, red cell count 3.1, MCV 70, MCH 26, MCHC 29. The white cell count was 9,800, platelets 388,000. The question is, what is the most likely cause for anemia in this patient? A, anemia of chronic disease. B, iron deficiency. C, beta thalassemia 3. D, chronic lead poisoning. E, myelodysplastic syndrome. The answer is chronic lead poisoning. So uh, looking at the x-rays, this patient, uh, the, the x-ray taken at the time of gunshot injury shows that there's a radiopaque lesion in the lateral aspect of the left knee joint, suggestive of a, uh, a bullet. And uh, after 12 years, the x-ray taken shows that there are features of arthritis as well as fragmentation of this uh, bullet and uh, it has spread uh, through the um, synovium as well as the joint space. And the full blood count shows that there's microcytic anemia. And the blood picture shows there's basophilic stippling. So this patient is having a retained bullet in the left knee synovium, which could be a lead bullet. And he has cognitive impairment as uh, shown uh, in the mini mental score and as anemia, hypochromic myxotic anemia with basophilic stippling. So the most likely diagnosis is lead poisoning. So those are the MCQs and these are the references. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kaso Maratna. Uh, for this excellent quiz. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there may be questions. Uh, the uh, question, uh, if I could ask you, of that uh, anti B12 uh, deficiency question, that antibody, anti parietal cell antibody, was it that you referred to? It's anti intrinsic factor. Anti intrinsic antibody. factor antibody. Do we have it here in Sri Lanka? Uh, that, of course, I'm not sure. So, in our yes. setting, what could we do? So, usually we uh, you should go by the um, clinical. Uh, we have so says that I'm, I have not done it in uh, here, but uh, anti intrinsic factor antibodies in private sector you can do. Raji, but you say is that B12 levels may not be that uh, uh, yes. useful in useful. the clinical management of these patients because that because it could uh, be known. diagnosis, because sometimes, uh, because if the if there's high T and intrinsic factor antibodies, yes. then uh, we can have a like falsely normal vitamin B12 level. Right, 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 right. Then with regard to the venous thrombosis imaging that uh, were presented, uh, the uh, TTP patient yes. uh, In general, we now got, you had a CT scan and a MRI scan uh, for us, to see acute infarctions, we have another image called the DW image, and this was a FLAI image that was present. That was a DW one. Maybe. Was it? Yeah, it's a DW. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah uh, the, 
So if it's a DW image, anyway, it's convenient for anyone to detect it. Whereas if it was a player image, then it's difficult to say that whether it's an accurate impact. Yeah, this is a DW uh, image. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think that's all that uh, uh, there were very, uh, I mean, sort of uh, three most interesting type of uh, hematological presentations representing a wide range of conditions that uh, would have definitely be useful for many of the doctors, uh, the doctors who are studying for the postgraduate exams. So I take this opportunity to thank the team uh, led by uh, Dr. Uh, Lalindra Gunaratne, the senior lecturer and the honorary consultant hematologist faculty of medicine, uh, and also for the contribution made by Dr. Vasanthi Vikram Singh to, and Dr. Indika Somaratne to make this uh, program so much interesting and a great success. So uh, on behalf of the uh, council and the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me uh, communicate our sincere gratitude in the usually accepted manner. So uh, that brings to an end. Uh, let me thank all uh, who got connected, joined uh, us online for this uh, academic program. Thanks, thank you very much.